Hey, stop that, DJ. Stop that. They are not here to hear music today. They are not here for the music. I promise you that. Hey, guys, how you doing? Um, I know. I I know. I I'm sorry. I it's been, it's been a few months uh, since I since I did something here. Um, as you know, life gets away from you. So I do apologize. This is uh, the first time in a couple of months since I put out a video here. It's also the first time in even a bit longer that I've put up a video in the in our intro to African history series. As you know, we do a few different things on this channel, um, profiles and, and other contemporary discussions, but the intro to African history is our longest running series. And I haven't put up a video. The, the last video I put up was on um, ancient Egypt, you know, old middle new kingdom. So we are continuing within that trajectory today and we'll be, this video is the natural, follow up to that video right i know we don't always put things in order even when in the, within the series but this video is the natural sort of successor or follow up to that ancient egypt and the idea here is to show that and we uh we'll be talking about nubia as well as axum and this is to show that a, you know a lot of times we talk about ancient egypt as if it was a monolithical civilization in on the continent at the time but but it wasn't and we've already seen these places in that last video because a lot of them interacted with ancient Egypt. Um, but we'll be talking about what else was going on on the continent at that time, on that level of, 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 of organization. So we'll be talking about Nubia and Axum today. Now, if you hear the song that I was playing earlier, I like to start my videos with a song. And the song is never random, you know? Maybe it is. I don't know. You tell me whether you feel. But this is uh, it's always connected to what we're talking about on the day. So the song I was playing earlier was by reggae and Afrobeat artists from Zimbabwe, King Isaac, uh, alongside Sugar Minot, who's a reggae legend, legend out of Jamaica. So what does that have to do with this place as well? Axum, right, is the forerunner, is, is in modern day Ethiopia, is the forerunner to the Ethiopian civilization, the Ethiopian country of today. Reggae music and the culture that surrounds it traces its roots to the Rastafari movement, which comes out of uh, de the deification of Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. And also the idea of uh, these two Pan-African singers, King Isaac and Sugar Minor singing together also plays into the Pan-Africanism of which Ethiopianism has been a driving force behind. Did I sell it? Did I sell it? Well, if I didn't, you know, I hope you enjoyed the video. Anyway, maybe I just played it because it's a favorite song. Shout out King Isaac, shout out Sugar Minor. Uh, but without further ado, without further ado, let's get to our material for today. And if it's all the same with you, it would appear that we are cooking with gas. Let's go. So like I said, we'll be looking at early Iron Age Africa, and we'll tie in this idea of the Iron Age into our narrative here, even though we'll be, we will be talking specifically about the communities out of it. And I've put in here a time stamp of 1000 BCE to, to 500 CE, but really what we're talking about will go back a little bit longer than that. And the idea here is to talk about those communities and the way in which they established themselves culturally, politically by themselves, and also how they interacted with other with, uh, with, uh, with other space, with other communities that were there at the time, All right? So the idea of Nubian kingdoms, right? Because a lot of times we like to, uh, let, me, let me take myself out of the picture here, yeah, I apologize. Um, so we can see the screen a little better here. The idea of Nubian kingdoms, or the, the reality of Nubian kingdoms, go back, to the date of Egypt's unification, which is around what, 3100 uh, BCE, some people say, you know, that's those, that's uh, which would be 5,000 years ago now. That's the usually agreed date to the unification of Egypt, right? And Nubian kingdoms, they date all the way back then. 
this is important to realize these aren't newer kingdoms or kingdoms that were born out of ancient Egypt. No, they existed themselves by then. In fact, early on, they had established themselves as a, as a trading partner. They were established the genesis, if you will, of Nubian kingdoms. And you see here, I say Iron Age Kush. I'll tell you where Kush comes from, but the community we're talking about is the same. And this is what we call, these are the Nubian kingdoms. So the first Nubian kingdoms really originate around uh, the first and the second cataract. So you see here, these numbers here are the cataracts all the way down to the sixth cataract down there. So around between Aswan and Wadi Alifa here or Abu Simbel, this general area is where the Nubian kingdoms originate. And of course, you know, all up here is the lower Nile, right? So lower Nile, it's important to remember that the Nile flows from here down to here. So this is the lower Nile, even though it looks up on the map. And lower is, is, I mean, the yeah. And the upper Nile is down here, even though it looks lower on the map. So, so obviously, Egypt, ancient Egypt, Kemet is up here and down here at the time. Now, they're trading, right? They trade, they do all these things. And as many trading partners will, sometimes they get into conflict. So, as Egypt pushed on, and really established itself as a powerhouse in the region, in the Middle Kingdom, what we call the Middle Kingdom. If you haven't watched the video on Egypt, go back and watch that to understand these this, 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 uh, this demarcations. Um, under King Anamorphis, under King Anamorphis, Egyptian King Anamorphis of the, of the second, of the Middle Kingdom, they are able to conquer, uh, to conquer Nubia, brings it under its control. Right. So at that time, this is uh this is very important. At that time, uh, the Middle Kingdom was sort of waning, but still strong enough to be able to to conquer uh what was then Nubia at the time. Then after so you know that was disrupted, right, with the end of the Middle Kingdom, which um ancient um the middle kingdom of ancient egypt fell for many reasons but the most prominent or the sort of the death now in their coffin was the was the invasion of the ishkos right or it's called h y s k o s ishkos or ishkos who invaded them at around that time a little bit after 2000 bc right defeated them and uh and sort of and these ishkos are said to have come from from what is modern day Israel or Palestine, right? Very uncertain, but that's where they said to have come from. They defe defeated uh, uh, Egyptian rule. And when you when they do that, the, the colonies as well, which we can say Nubia was a colony this time, became independent. However, this didn't last long because Egypt regroups and begins the Middle Kingdom, establishes a standing army, right? To, to make sure that they can withstand the attacks from from foreign entities such as the Hiskos had done. So they established a standing army. And again, they begin to grow and expand, right? Under the king of, under Pharaoh. Now this is where the term Pharaoh comes into play in ancient Egypt. So they are under the Pharaoh Tutmosis, the first, the Egyptians pushed down as far as the fourth and fifth cataract. Right, all the way down to where is Magna Pata. Now, Napata didn't really exist as a as a as a spot at the time, but they were able to push all the way down here. Right, remember they used to just be up here, but they were able to push all the way up there. That's at the at the height of the of the new kingdom, and it's most powerful. Right, uh, so between eighteen hundred and fifteen hundred BCE, uh, Nubia, right, was under Egyptian control. But in all this, it still remained, you know, even though the culture of the Egyptians, it's a lot of impact on them. They also rem remained a very distinct people. But it is also at this time that we start to see, we start to see um, the name Kush introduced in Egyptian writings to describe these communities. This is where we start to see that. Now, around, and of course, then after that, they break away again from 
the breakaway again from the rise up and resistance, the breakaway from the from the from the new kingdom and establish themselves. An important moment in Kushite development was the building of Napata, right? Napata, which again, as you can see, is here by the fourth. So around 1100 BCE, they established Napata. And now this marks an important era in their story, right? It marks a very important era in their story because now they start to grow. They grow so much that by they've established themselves that 300 years later, the community is so strong that as Egypt, the, as the new kingdom of, of, of ancient Egypt is now sort of waning and is sort of dying out, they actually come back, the, the Kushites, and rule over Egypt for 700 years. 100 years, they ruled over Upper Egypt, right? Which again, if you, if you remember what I was talking about, is this lower part here. And for 50 of those years, they ruled the whole thing. And this is what well, this was the 25th dynasty of ancient Egypt, right? 25th dynasty of ancient Egypt. And in fact, a lot of people still describe it in history as the black dynasty, because if you know the new uh, the, the Nubians will be darker skinned, right? The sort of the ancestors of the Nile or Saharan communities of today. So they did that. And only, and but this was to an Egyptian, you know, even though it was ruled over by, by, by the Nubians, it was still, uh, it's still considered an, an Egyptian dynasty, right? However, when the Assyrians invaded in 670 uh, BC, right? Uh, in, so in the seventh century BC, the Assyrians invade and are able to take over. They essentially bring the end to the, to the, to the new kingdom essentially, right, they, they bring an end to, to, to what was um, the new kingdom of, 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 ancient, of, of ancient Egypt. Um, but with that, that, they also forced the, the Nubians to retreat back uh, into, into Napata, into, into their territory. And, but an interesting thing happens here, which is what, you know, the title mentioned, the Iron Age, and this is important to that. One of the ways in which they were defeated that the, the the Egyptians, Egyptian armies that were there under the rule of the Nubians were with were not able to withstand the attacks of the Assyrians so much as the Assyrians instead of using uh, bronze and uh, weapons of bronze and stone stone as uh, as the the Egyptians and the Nubians were more familiar with, they had weapons of iron, right? Which is uh, you know. Is a, is a much stronger, much more malleable, much more destructive way of building, of, of, of constructing weapons. So they're able to, uh, to defeat them pretty, pretty handily. But what that does, it also introduces this idea of, okay, iron, right? Even though people had been dealing with iron for a while after this, but it really encourages or pushes, incentivizes the use of iron as weaponry and other things. So this really thrusts this community into, what we call the Iron Age. So what became of, of the Nubians who were now who were, were now centered in Napata after this happened, after they were, after the fall of the new kingdom and them sort of retreating back into, into their own homeland. So around in the sixth century BC, around 590 BC, they moved, the Kushites moved their capital city from Napata, right, let's see here, uh, from Napata up here to Mero a bit further down here. You know, some of the maps have it here, uh, but you know, to Mero, they established Mero. Um, so why did they move? Why did they move from Napata, which had served them pretty well uh, for a while? So. This is important to, to realize, right? Because it's been about a uh, hundred years since they were removed from, from Egypt. Uh, so they moved the capital city to Mero. Mero didn't immediately overtake Napata. It took like 200 years for, for Mero to become as successful as Napata, also to become the eminent community of the Kushites in, 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 in the area. But uh, the seeds had been set around 590 BC. So why did they move? Why did they move? Well. For one, 
remember they had been beefing with the with the Egyptians who by now were overtaken by the Assyrians and now the Persians have entered the game as well so there was always that threat of uh, of being attacked by the by the Egyptians or the Persians right so the Kushites or Nubians the Kushites they moved down a little bit to the south now on the map it looks like it's very close to each other but it's not even that far it's like 200 miles but it's 200 more miles right uh further down south which which puts you a little further out of reach of 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 your enemies of your historic enemies but that wasn't the only factor otherwise they may have moved even further if it was just about that but it, it also coincided with um several economic advantages one of them was the land was very rich in iron ore and timber remember iron just became very important to this community because they have to because of the, the Assyrian attacks and just the sort of the, the birth and thrust into the Iron Age that they're trying to establish as well. There's also a lot of timber, which is great for, for building and for, for different things that they get into. So this area is very timber rich as compared to Napata. Another thing is being a bit further down south, it, it now falls within that tropical zone of Africa. So it's also very rich for tropical rainfall, right? And it's right on the Nile, which is always good. Also, it's also perfect for trade. Watch this. Um, as you can see here, it's uh, right on the on the on the on the Nile, right? So any trout, even if you're still trading with with Egypt on better days, you know you're still right by the Nile. You can do that, but you also now have a little more uh, closer access to the Red Sea, right? Just right by the right over here, so they can do that as well. They can trade with the Red Sea. Uh, through the Red Sea and then still retain access to the Nile. So this was the reason why Mero was established where it was um, indeed. So let's talk more about, about Mero once it grew. We have a little bit of information here. So the, the Meroitic society was mainly, um, you know, cattle herders and farmers, right? They're very which is again why that place would have appealed so much to them, right? They were they were they were um, cattle herders and farmers, right? So the waterways and and the tropical rainfall would have been perfect for them. The king established wealth. You know his wealth was controlled by by controlling that trade. You know people paying tributaries to him uh, as people traded by way of the Red Sea and by way of the Nile. So this is how the king was able to establish. And initially. Remember, they had ruled over Egypt for a while. They'd also been ruled by the Egyptians for a long time. So initially, their religion, and this is this just speaks to the extent of influence that ancient Egypt had on the region as a whole, right? Which is why a lot of people talk about it as sort of like a pan-African sentiment because of its impact across 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 the region. A very Egyptianized initially, such that um, they worshipped Egyptian gods such as Amun. Um, and and they also their their kings were also buried in pyramids. Which interestingly, so this place we are talking about, I didn't mention this earlier. This place we are talking about, right, uh, Nubia, is in is modern day what, modern day Sudan. So Sudan and South Sudan, that area. Um, but in fact, in in Mero, within that civilization, it has the most pyramids of any place in the world. You would think it's Egypt, you know, or even other parts of the world that have similar similar structures, but actually the most pyramids in the world can be found in Sudan. Um, of course, these are some of them here, much smaller, much smaller. This ain't no pyramid of Giza by any stretch, but uh, they, you know, which, but it shows the fact that they'd adopted a lot of, uh, of Egyptian structures as well as, um, as well as worth noting that the official language for a long time in Mero was uh was egyptian right that's the language that was used in the court documents in whatever writings they have and even then later on as an anti-egyptian sentiment began to grow as anti-egyptian sentiments began to grow the 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 develops a, a distinct meroitic language which still borrowed some elements from ancient egypt from from egyptian hieroglyphics but um uh, but uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, established its its own 
identity, its own identity, its own language, also added its own gods, such as we see here. This is, uh, I believe, Epidemic. Epidemic was the lion god and is being uh, worshipped. This was found in one of the tombs, even the pottery style. Let me get to my sources here real quick and so we can I can read specifically to you what some of the, the differences here are that, that our scholars have seen. Its gods and rituals were primarily those of Mero, not Egypt. While good Egyptian hieroglyphics continue to be used in temple inscriptions, the Kusites now began writing their own language in an alphabetic script which has yet to be understood. The fine painting of pottery reached a new excellence and the styles used were largely Kusite. Mero became very much a civilization in its own right. And this civilization was one of considerable depth and range of culture. So this wasn't just some knockoff ancient Egypt uh, uh, culture, it was its own culture. To it all, they had heart, heart and cold relations with the Egyptians and the Romans. Egyptians, of course, um, earlier, before, they, before the Romans took over Egypt as we went into the common era. Uh, sometimes they would be trading with them, sometimes they would fight with them. And we will we will talk about that that dichotomy real quickly here as I reach to my, to my other sources. But so they had a good run, right? We saw that they were established around 600 CE, 590, I mean, BC. Uh, and, but they declined around 300 in the common era, right? And one of the things that happens, uh, you know, they were very much dependent on the iron ore and timber of the space. But after a while, after a few hundred years, that environment got depleted. So since a lot of their trade and, 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 and sustenance was dependent on that, that put them on the back burner. Secondly, because they had built such a symbiotic relationship with the Romans up north after they'd taken over Egypt, as the Roman empire began to decline, you know, if, you're, if your biggest trading partner starts to go down and you don't have the access to to other trading partners immediately. It, your economy might take a hit, you know, which is why today people are very invested in the stability of their trading partners, right? Even in modern uh, dynamics, indeed. So as the Roman empire declined, okay, that also became a, a an, an, an issue here, right? Um, you know, because now the Romans were the ones who were demanding a lot of their goods but now that they weren't there. Then finally, a big factor into this was the rise of Axum, which we'll talk about next, right? The rise of Axum, um, their access, Axum was just right to, and you will see this in the next slide, Axum was just right to the, to the, to the, to the east of Mero, which if you remember correctly, one of the biggest thing that they depended on was their trade to the Red Sea, but Axum rising up there meant that they're now blocking that they now have, Axum now has eminence on the coast, which also cuts off a very important supply. So now you can trade with the Romans to the north since their, their economy and, and state really has gone down, but now you can trade into Western Asia as well because uh, Axum has come in there. Then of course, in 300, around 350, King Ezana of Axum de defeats what was left of Mero. And that's what we'll talk about in the next slide. Indeed. So Axum. So some people have spoken about Axum and suggested, suggested, I say suggested here yeah, because, you know, it's still not conclusive. People still aren't sure what the, the land of Punt in history was what exactly it was. But some people have suggested that based on this location, actually it might have been around this area of Ethiopia, which is might have, so that, but that would be before a thousand BC. What we do know, what we do know is that at about the same time that Meroitic Kush, 600 BC thereabouts, was starting to find its voice and get into, into its peak. Axum was also rising but it didn't hit the heights or anywhere close to Mero until the, the common era, right? But they, they are rising. And this is, how, this is how the story goes of how they were established. There's of course, African peoples who were already there, the original people of the land of Punt or whatever you call it at the time that were joined at some point 
around 600 BC by hunters and traders from Saba. Now Saba is uh, modern day Yemen, right? Modern day Yemen. And this is interesting because they they the 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 Sabians, as we call them, the Sabians, tie their own origin story to a very important biblical story of of Queen Sheba, which again the word Saba is supposed to be uh so, you know to be related historically to the word Sheba, right? What's the story of Queen Sheba? Queen Sheba, for for those of you who are who who are who know the stories of the Bible, was the woman who went over and had relations with uh, King Solomon of, 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 of Israel, right? You know, David's son and got pregnant by him. And she, she had gone back to Yemen and apparently she bore a child and this child became the forefather of the, of the, of the Sabians, right? So they tied themselves closely to this uh, Solomonic, Solomonic um, religion, a religious bloodline. So anyway, those folks come over to Axum and and settled among the, the African people who were there and initially introduced a language known as Sabian, which later um, blended with the language of the local people, which became known as JS, right? The, the language that became JS, and they actually developed a script onto their own, which is represented in this picture here. Eventually, that language becomes Amharic, right? And we'll talk about Amar Amharic a bit later here. We'll talk about Amharic a bit later here. And around, so it's been growing at a slower pace, but first century CE, right? So that's between, um, you know, between zero AA CE and, and 100 CE, they start to really pick up and become a, a, a powerful state. They become a very powerful state and even overtakes Mero as the preeminent state in the region. Remember Mero, you can see Mero on the map is just right outside of here, but now, Mero, the environment is starting to deplete a little bit. Their relations with the Romans are hot and cold. Axum is growing, is at its peak right now. And we'll, we'll talk shortly about how big, just how big, uh, you know, Mero had become. I mean, Axum, sorry, how big Axum and influential it had become. Let's look at that. So by the first century CE, those JS speaking farmers and traders who were now centered in, in, in Northeast Africa had developed their, their powerful state, which was known as Axum. The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, which is a Greek shipping manual, which is very important, uh, which was a very important travel document at the time, which was pretty much the, the, the map quest of the time, right? Reported that Axum's Red Sea port of Adulis, let's go back, Adulis, right, over here, uh, had become the most important ivory market in the whole of Northeast Africa, um, right? And at this point, you know, that's when you can start to see that they're already wrestling away the African ivory trade away from Mero, right? So because the, the even the, peri, the periplus of Eritrean Sea say so. Okay, so by 300 CE, they are very prosperous. They have extensive trade. They have with the Red Sea trade going, okay? They have the Red Sea trade going. They have the you know they trade in silver, gold, um, olive oil, wine. They have a lot of things that they are trading, right? They even minted coins, they even minted coins, which when you think about it at the time is incredible, right? This is almost 2,000 years ago now, 1800 years ago, they minted coins. And um, which, which is something that Mero never did. Mero had never done that. So they are doing very well. And at its peak, the kingdom even included Saba, which is again, modern day Yemen, right? And by, by its peak, we're talking about uh, maybe around by 500 CE, they had even expanded into, into having Yemen, right? Remember a lot of the people had originally come from Yemen and they actually, uh, 
expanded to include Yemen. So they were part in Africa and the Middle East, both a very powerful kingdom Aksum had become. And one of the things that they are famous for is their kings were buried. And these are some of the structures that are still ten, standing today. This structure here known as the stele or, or howelt, as they call it, stele is the more uh, European as a word for it, but howelt, this is where the, the, the kings were buried. So, you know, proto-pyramid-esque, but, but, you know, different. So they, 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 they were their own community, right? Very powerful community. Um, and pivotal turning moment, pivotal turning moment was here when they defeated, uh, when uh, the King Ezana, right? Their King Ezana was their very important King, um, was converted to, to Christianity, right? Was converted to Christianity. Um, and a lot of this was motivated in part by trade, because remember the Greeks at this point had picked up the religion and he wanted to be to have a religion on par with them that they could trade with them. So he just converted. It wasn't really about the about believing in the in the doctrine, which he may have, but a large part of that was so that he could trade with them. So he converted and began to trade. And also at this point, remember the Meroites were already on their way down, well, their, 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 their Western neighbors. But uh, but um, in around 350, he finally defeats the last of the of the of the Meroites, who are known by the name Noba. So people, scholars have been debating whether the Noba were the original rulers of 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 Mero, or were this a community that had stepped in after the the powers that be were going down anyway because of, uh, because like we said, Mero was already on its way down. But in any case, the the, the Noba people were, were viciously defeated uh, and really brought an end to, to, uh, to the kingdom of Mero, right? So Axum is, is the reason for that. Um, later on, it's also very important. Oh, in this picture, it's very important to talk about this. This document here, this is a monk, an Ethiopian monk, right? Looking at this Bible, which is written in Jez, that language, is the oldest, most complete Bible known in the world. And it was found in all the monasteries of this era. Uh, again, showing to how quickly a strong Christian tradition developed in, in this region. And uh, yeah, so this monk is holding this this. this but this book here. And as you can tell here, the strong monastic culture develops as monks from Syria reach the kingdom and develop a strong monastic culture uh, and even establish the Aksumite Christian church. Eventually, however, they, as kingdoms do, they decline. They, uh, they, they they decline as well. And the most important reason here is they lost their trade, you know, their, their privileged trade position, but they lost that privileged, privileged trade position to Persia in, uh, in Arabia in the seventh century CE. What has happened in this in the in the seventh century CE, no, in the eighth century CE, sorry. So well, these are the seven hundreds. What has happened in this era that wasn't there before? Well, Islam has risen, you know, born in what we call uh in the year 622 in the common era, right? But it, it picks up steam so quickly that in a few decades, it's the most powerful force of nationalism and, and, and across, the, across that area, across Northern Africa, North and the Middle East. So once that's established, you know, they're able to take control of different trade routes, okay? They take control of different trade routes and, uh, and much of the trade between the Indian Ocean and the Eastern Mediterranean now passed through the Persian Gulf, right, where the, where the Muslims are, rather than the Red Sea. So, so that's a large part of it, losing their trade to the Arabs and the, and, the, and, the, and the Persians, but also a lot of it had to do with the environment. Again, this was the long, the result of the long-term cutting down of trees and of our exploitation of the soil, leading to the kind of erosion so typical of the region today. So, so even though Axum itself remains sort of like this religious symbolic site by 800 CE, so by the time we got into the ninth century CE, 
uh, you know, it was pretty much over for, for, for that kingdom indeed. So that pretty much marks the end of this great kingdom of Axum, which gave us so much, gave us such standing structures as, as the as the stelae here. It's the, the space out of which the, the, the most ancient Bible comes out of, um, indeed. So let's look at one more community today of the region. And that's the Phoenicians, right? The Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians, it is understood, were originally from, from Lebanon. Now, it is very important here. I, I want to take a moment to stop here because a lot of this may sound like removing African agency from this. That is not what I'm doing at all. One, people travel, you know, you know, and, and communities interact, okay? Uh, so, so that's standard. But also these communities, when they get there, right? We are talking about who else came and brought what, but they met up with people who were already there to develop these new communities, right? So this right now, we, we always take it for granted that there were people already there. That's a fact. But they also interacted with these people, brought these skills and those skills, and they came together and advanced the the the, the kingdom. So when you talk, when I talk about the Sabians coming from from Yemen, right? They are interacting with the people who were already the original people of the original Axumites, if you will, to to develop this community that is this new uh, identity. The same thing with the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians were the seafaring traders, and you can tell that in their in their artwork such as this, which uh, had a lot of ships and, and things like that. They are around 600 BC, uh, they've, been they've been traveling around seafaring traders and they end up in East Africa. They end up in East Africa, um, no, sorry, not East Africa, in, uh, in West, Northwest Africa, where modern day Tunisia sits, Tunisia, Algeria, that general region, okay? East of Egypt, West of Egypt. I'll get my, 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 my bearings wrong, West of Egypt. Um, but they'd been around for a while. They'd go, they go back centuries, they'd occupied the Levant, right? Which is modern day where Lebanon is, since about the time of the Middle Kingdom in Egypt. Um, but uh, they did set out and set up shop. Initially, they set up these places in, in Tunisia, Algeria, as sort of outpost for their trading to with Spain, with Spain. But they settled there, then eventually they, um, more, of, more of them came and they ended up establishing communities and settling among the Berbers. Now the Berbers were the African people who were already there, right? the people of North Africa. And, um, and they brought with them specialized skills in iron working, okay? And, and, and while the, the Berbers provided food for them initially, right? Provided food for them. Initially the Phoenicians end up establishing their own identity and became Carthaginians. Uh, establishing the city of Carthage, which for a long time was the capital city of Tunisia before Tunis became it. Um, and they also established a very good trade with the, with the Berbers. So by, two, by 200 years later, by 600 BCE, Carthage is very, very, is a very powerful city at the time. So if you're looking at it, we have Carthage, which, which is a powerful city at the time. We have Egypt, ancient Egypt at this point at 600 BC, which is on its way down, but has been a pretty powerful state as well. But remember Napata by now has been established and is a, is a powerful state and, and, and Mero happens right about this time, right? And Mero is established as well. And of course, Axum at this point is a few hundred years from being as powerful as it, as it ever was, but it was also established. So we have these big cities that are doing trade all around that region in, in Northern Africa. Indeed. Uh, so the Berbers were excellent traders, right? So the Berbers and the uh, Phoenicians, now known as the Carthaginians, lived together within this space. They still had distinct communities, but interacted a lot, right? They interacted a lot. Um, and one of the most symbiotic ways in which they, 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 they traded was the Berbers were excellent with the Trans-Saharan trade. So they would go down to what is modern day Mali, these places, right? 
this is all in the in the in the BCE. This is all before the common era and go there and they would get things like gold from the mines of, of Ghana, right? Um, they would get copper from down there. They would get ivory. Remember the Ivory Coast and areas like that are down there. Then they would bring them up, carry them across the Sahara and then trade with the, with the, with the, with the Carthaginians who were originally the Phoenicians who may take them these things into Spain. And a lot of what was usually gotten from the North of Africa was salt which was traded a lot of time to, to the, to the uh, sub-Saharan communities, right? Those are the Phoenicians. And they would go on, they would have a good run. They would have a pretty good run until about the beginning, beginning of the common era when, when the Punic Wars, when the Romans uh, attacked, uh, you know, fought against the Phoenicians uh, you know, in the Punic Wars, right? Punic actually is the is sort of a you know a a, a dialectic way of saying Phoenician. So they are finally defeated in the Punic Wars, and it it is at that point that Carthage becomes uh, another Roman city. So when you look at this here, this is uh, an amphitheater, a Roman amphitheater in in modern day Car uh, Carthage. Right, it looks like it could be just right in the dead center of Rome, right? But that's how much impact the Romans had in that community. For the Berbers, however, who had been able to maintain their sort of independence and distinct cultural identity all this time, the, the switch wasn't that crazy for them. It was just they were trading one partner, one, one trading and cultural partner in the form of the, of the Carthaginians with another in the form of the Romans, right? So they were able to maintain their independent identity. Now, eventually, of course, as the Roman emperor, empire grew, grew stronger and stronger, a lot of times they were able, they were even usurped into their Roman way, into the Roman way of life, with many of them even moving from, from Africa into the Mediterranean parts of Europe. And, uh, but however, I know this, they still retain their distinct Berber identity. So, this is very uh, interesting thing, uh, stuff to talk about. So that's a little bit about the Phoenicians as well, right? The fa seafaring traders who came from Lebanon, settled among the, the Berbers, created a symbiotic relationship that ran strong for a few hundred years, almost to a century before the Romans came over and were able to defeat them in, in, a, in a series of battles and eventually uh, establish a Roman community. Um, on the African continent through uh, things like, uh, you know, still seen through things like the, the amphitheater here. All right, so that was it for this video, guys. Uh, our key takeaways for today, uh, you know, just to think about the capitals and structures of the Nubian and Axum civilizations, Axum we might run into in, an, in other spaces called AXUM, right? Remember which, when it was at its peak, right? When Napata was established, then Mero a few years later, right? Then Axum comes in around 300, you know, uh, 300 in the common era, it was at its peak. When did each decline, right? And why did it decline? These things are important because they show interaction as well, because the decline of Mero is tied to the rise of Axum, right? The decline of Napata is tied to the rise of Mero, even though they're the same people. But it is also tied to the fear of the Egyptians that are possibly coming back. Something else that was interesting, what script is oldest, the most oldest, most complete known Bible? And remember, it's the language that was established by the, by the Sabians, but evolved into something which was uh, blended with the contemporary African language, and later on it became Amharic. But what was that language? What were the Carthaginians known for? Where did they come from? Where did they settle? And what was their relationship with the Berbers? And how did that kingdom decline? Right. So hopefully you guys have had fun. I'm I, I I've loved being back with you guys. Um, Hopefully I won't be gone too long this time. I'll try to be a little more consistent this time, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, um, show some love, like, and comment. Uh, I'll put as many of my sources as well as a song I played at the beginning in the description below. 
And if there is nothing else, I will stop sharing here and bid you guys adieu. Musara shaka na kama zangu. One.